There's a lot of people who claim to be prophets, you know, go down to certain street corners and you'll see them with the sandwich signs. The end is nigh. You go to the, the inner city of most large cities around the country and you'll see people, the end is nigh, all these prophets, all these self-proclaimed prophets. What is the message of a true prophet? They tell a story of a medieval uh, astrologer who makes a prophecy to the king that his wife is going to die very shortly. And he tells it over to the king and lo and behold, not long later, the king's wife passes away. And the king is furious because he assumes that it was the prophecy itself, it was the actual foretelling itself that killed the queen. And so the king is enraged and the word spread that the king was enraged and word got back to this astrologer. And he summoned the astrologer, the local prophet, into his chamber, into his palace, and had a plan, a, a plan to get back of the wrong that had been done to him. And he called him in and he said, I'd like you to make a prophecy. When is it that you will die? And so the prophet, he realizes that whenever he says the king is actually going to kill him. So he freezes and he's nervous and he says, I don't know. All of a sudden he gets an idea. Nice Jewish guy. And he says, King, your majesty, I don't know when it will be, but I know that when it happens, you'll die three days later. Oh. <laughs> the belief in prophecy is one of the 13 principles of faith. When the Rambam, the medieval sage Maimonides, codifies the essential beliefs of Judaism, the belief in prophecy that God communicates to mankind through prophets is one of those essential um, pillars. The word Navi, the word for prophet in Hebrew, comes from the words Niv Safsaim, which means the fruit of the lips, that which is produced from the lips. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who receives messages from God in order to transmit them to the people. Now, now what is, what's contained in those messages? There's a lot of people who claim to be prophets, you know, go down to certain street corners and you'll see them with the sandwich signs, the end is nigh. You go to the, the inner city of most large cities around the country and you'll see people, the end is nigh, all these prophets, all these self-proclaimed prophets. What is the message of a true prophet? It's not the purpose of existence. It's not to legislate new laws and tell people what they're meant to to be doing some nuanced thing. That's in the Torah. Laws and purpose are confined to the Torah. The prophet's goal, the reason that Hashem sends a prophet, is in order to make corrections in the direction of Jewish society or society at large. Sometimes it's to tell the future in order to encourage us uh, in our mission in life. Isaiah, Yeshaya, uh, tells of the messianic era, the culmination and reward of all of our efforts. Or the prophet comes to tell us where we're slacking off and what the dire consequences could be if we keep along this path. The prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, tells of the destruction of the Holy Temple. That if you keep, if the Jewish people keep up their bad behavior, this is going to be the result. Yaina, Jonah, 
he sent to Ninveh to warn the people that they would be destroyed unless they repent as well. Now, a prophet was not allowed to change anything that the Torah commanded. In fact, we'll learn a little bit later that if a prophet tries to do that, that's one of the key indicators that he's a false prophet. So a prophet was never allowed to permanently make a change to Jewish law. For example, if a prophet comes around excuse me, and says that the Sabbath, Shabbos, is no longer applicable. God changed his mind. You know, enough of that. You know this guy is not a prophet. If he says that tefillin are no longer meant to be worn, or that the laws of keeping kosher are no longer applicable, you know, to cast him away. He's, he's not a true prophet uh, from God. Now, there was uh, an exception in, in extenuating circumstances. A prophet was allowed to temporarily alleviate a commandment of the Torah. For example, we are told that the prophet Elijah, in order to prove the point that God was trying to instill in the people, was allowed to offer a sacrifice outside of the holy temple. Since when the temple was built, and from then on, um, um, sacrifices could only be offered from that place. It couldn't be offered just any old place that you choose. The prophet Elijah it was, it was allowed to temporarily suspend the law, but it can't be a complete abrogation of, a, of an established Torah law. That was Mount Carmel? Oh, yeah. Alan's been coming to classes. <laughs> I shouldn't read it. Yeah. <laughs> so how does one become a prophet? Ooh, choose me. <laughs> First, you have to become worthy. That's tough. How does a person become worthy for prophecy? Or how did a person become worthy for prophecy? They had to be wise. They had to be of clear and lucid mind, of impeccable character, in full control of their evil inclination, of calm and joyous constitution. They have to shun materiality and the, and the uh, frivolities of life. They have to, to uh, devote themselves entirely to knowing God and serving God. In fact, at certain points in Jewish history, there were prophecy schools in which a person would sort of join the school and a person of, of these character traits would join the school and really just engage themselves full, full on, full force, in trying to attain the level of prophecy. Meaning, cultivating righteousness, cultivating learning, and, and prolonged meditation. These were uh, ways of making a person a vessel to receive prophecy. So, when, the, when, these, when these potential prophets were in the prophecy school, they would cultivate themselves to make themselves into a vessel that would be someone who's possibly capable of receiving prophecy. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, this is something that was done by divine election. It wasn't something that if I sit three years in prophecy school, I'm a prophet. I graduate as a prophet. You know, you turn your tassel, and now you're a prophet, and you can go warn the world of all the wonderful good things and terrible bad things that are coming. It didn't work like that. The prophecy schools were meant as sort of like a, a yeshiva environment that the person, the people cultivated themselves into um, vessels to be able to receive prophecy. Now, that doesn't mean that they were going to become a prophet, it just meant that you perhaps were uh, capable of receiving prophecy. Ultimately, again, it was something by divine election. If God decided that you were the person who which the prophecy was going to come through, you would uh, all of a sudden have prophecy. The, the prophecy experience was like an uncontrolled ESP. Uh, prophecy would manifest itself without any warning signals. Now, how are prophets verified? Again, we see lots around the city. You see uh, the end is nigh people with the sandwich signs and hear ye, hear ye, and making a big tumult about uh, all sorts of different things. How is a prophet verified? How do you know that someone is a prophet or not? So first of all, they have to possess those attributes that we mentioned before, God-fearingness, learnedness, uh, meditative qualities, shunning the evil inclination, etc. Um, then that person, 
they, if they announce that they received prophecy, it's assumed that they are telling the truth. Now, not just, again, not just any old person, a person of that upright character who, who says that they've had prophecy, we assume that, that they um, are telling the truth, and then it comes to a test to see if the actual prophecy that they declare comes out into fruition. Now, the accuracy um, of his prophecy were, uh, were not counted with uh, calamities. Meaning if the prophet says, I've received a prophecy, and he tells of some calamity that's going to happen next week, and it doesn't come to be, we don't necessarily you know, cut him off and say he's not a, a true prophet. Because with negative prophecies, there's always the chance that the Jewish people, or people at large, are going to do teshuva, that they're going to repent, amend their ways, and that God's going to rescind that possible scenario that was going to come about. So if he prophesies something that good is going to happen, though, and it doesn't, uh, that it doesn't come, excuse me, it doesn't come about, then we know that this guy is a, is, is a false prophet. Now, the, the, the character of the actual prophecy itself, there were, there were two criteria that, that went into it. It had to be specific and non-predictable to be a viable prophecy. Meaning, if you're sitting around in the summer in Florida, and you say, the Lord hath told me five inches of rain tomorrow, you're not a prophet. I don't care if there's exactly five inches of rain. Sorry, Charlie, not a prophet. <laughs> Just the way it works. Again, it has to be something very specific and non-predictable. So if you're sitting in the Florida summer and you say it's going to snow 10 inches of snow tomorrow, and there was no weather uh, indicators of that, meteorologists didn't, then you, you, might have, uh, you might have something going for you. But it has to be very specific and non-predictable. 